like I've, I've done the Indian Pacific wheel race twice now and every year for the first 2000 Ks it's usually a headwind so you kind of just get accustomed to being just hit in the face sitting on what you imagine to be a really long climb. Episode 402, The Triple Crown of Ultra Distance Cycling with Ryan Flynn. You're listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast, brought to you by 180 Tech. We talk with adventurers from around the globe to bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to get started in the outdoors or to keep you moving if you're already there. This episode is brought to you by Kind. Kind makes delicious, healthy snacks using whole ingredients. I know you've heard me say it in the past, but the press bars by Kind are absolutely the best. In fact, my new favorite is now the dark chocolate and banana kind press bar. I had this on a motorcycle trip while we were away on our summer break, and it is awesome. Make sure you take a few minutes to go over to kindsnacks.com slash sports so you can sign up for 20 kind bars for $20 with their new snack pack. That's 50% off, and you receive free shipping on your first snack pack when you subscribe to it through the Snack Club. Go to kindsnacks.com slash sports. That's kindsnacks.com slash sports. Hey friends, thank you for listening again today to the Adventure Sports Podcast. Today is about ultra-distance cycling. We have Ryan Flynn with us, and Ryan is attempting this year something that has never before been done. It's the triple crown of ultra-cycling. That is the Indian Pacific Wheel Race, the Trans-American Bike Race, and the Transcontinental Race in Europe. These are huge races. We're talking about things like 4,000-mile-long races And Ryan is trying to race all three of these in one year to set a new record. Ryan, welcome to the program. Hello. Uh, Thanks. uh, Thanks for having me. (laughs) Oh, you bet. This is going to be so much fun. I told you before I hit record here, Ryan, that I don't know a whole lot about this. I used to do some distance cycling. But when I say distance cycling, I mean like 70 or 80 miles a day, not the 150 for, for two weeks. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And so yeah, this yeah, is all kind of kind of be new to me. So I'm excited to learn more about this. Um, first of all, who's Ryan Flynn? Where did you grow up? Uh, a 32-year-old boy from South Africa uh, that now lives in Melbourne in Australia. Um, yeah, grew up in, well, all sorts of places in Southern Africa. Um, parents are Zimbabwean and uh yeah we kind of they they moved to South Africa where I was born and I grew up in Swaziland which is a little kingdom inside South Africa and yeah been all been all over um the place traveling around um my dad's a farmer so yeah I had had a great childhood kind of growing up um in the Cape in the Western Cape um in Swaziland kind of all, all around Durban and uh, White River and Joburg and Pretoria and on the border between Botswana and South Africa and, yeah, Mozambique. Wow. So, so you are the, the South African guy. You've seen it all down there. Yeah, yeah, I guess uh, I, I guess so. We're all, um, well, uh, we as in Curve, uh, the the business I have with some friends, we're all just cycling, cycling nuts, I guess, or we'll draw upon very different skill sets. So it, yeah, it's a nice, a nice team, but I guess, yeah, I'm the, uh, I guess I'm the South African. We have an Italian, um, in, in Adam and, uh, Jesse, um, is kind of, well, he's Adelaidean with German heritage. And then Steve is Thai. He's also grew up in in Adelaide and now lives in Melbourne so we're all kind of an interesting mix of riding disciplines and uh, backgrounds yeah, yeah a lot of varied backgrounds so are you all in Melbourne now yeah we are we all kind of um, work and live pretty close together and so that's curve cycling that we're talking about yeah curve curve cycling is kind of an Australian cycling brand um, we focus mainly on um, handmade titanium and steel bikes of all descriptions mainly bikes that we uh we we make to pursue an adventure so similar adventures that we're we're really chatting about today so great well i want to come back to that a little bit later in the show and get more details especially because what i see in the stores so much these days are bikes that 
they're not made for the the distance and for the the beating that you have to put on yeah. a bike. You know what I mean for what you're doing. And uh, it sounds like maybe Curve Cycling has sorted some of that out. Yeah, I guess um, that's perhaps our niche. Uh, we've kind of carved out a little um, uh, area of our own inside the cycling kind of family. Um, so a, a lot of our adventures have, have been about community and fun, but also having a product that um, is really rugged and can can last a very long time and that's probably why we chose to build with uh, titanium and and with steel hmm. i have interviewed a lot of people that have done extended rides on bikes not about these massive races like you're doing but extended oh, yeah. rides and it seems like every time i ask they they don't say oh i'm on a carbon or i you know i've got this aluminum frame it's almost always oh no chromoly steel you know I, i'm on a steel bike yeah yeah, steel's great in, in in the fact that you can kind of beat it up and um, it'll it'll stand the test of time really. But also, if you're in very remote locations, anyone can really work with steel. Whereas titanium's perhaps a, a, a more kind of uh, um, delicate metal that y- you need a lot of specific kind of experience and tooling to work with whereas steel you can kind of just cut a bit off weld a bit on (laughs) off you go keep on going through kind of you know zambia or parts of angola and everyone's worked on steel before whereas titanium is kind of more of a magical metal that uh, requires a bit more of uh, love and attention right but yeah you're right i guess the guys you've interviewed in the past they're 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 probably wanting something that uh, is pretty easy to to, to fix if something does go wrong, which invariably it does. <laughs> right, right. Well, let's get back to this triple crown attempt. And then I want to talk, uh, spend the most time on the Trans-American bike race because that's the one that you yeah. just finished. And so it'd be fun to get something that's just hot off the press. But um, triple crown. Now, give us a little bit more detail. I rattled off what the three races are, but we need people to appreciate um, the distances involved and the times involved, and are these all self-supported? Yeah, so they're all self-supported or um, unsupported. Um, so you pretty much uh, everyone ha- is on an even playing field, which I quite like. Um, it's not an arms race or uh, whoever's got the most amount of money or sponsorship has the best chance of survival. It's everyone's on an even playing field, really. Um you can only access what's freely available to everyone else. Mm, Um, The Indian Pacific wheel race is essentially exactly uh, what it says on the tin. It starts on one side of Australia in Western Australia, which is on the Indian Indian Ocean um, in a place called Fremantle, just south of Perth. And you traverse across Australia through Western Australia, across the uh, the Nullarbor, which is, it seems to fill a lot of riders with dread because it is a remote kind of location. Um, it's a desert um, and it can get very, very hot. And um, there's only one main arterial road that crosses pretty much from Western Australia into South Australia. And that stretch of desert is around, it's over a thousand kilometres. Mm. Um, with with some sections of um, you know maybe 200 k's um, so 120 miles of um, nothing no food or water and you kind of have to carry enough to to survive wow um yeah so it's five and a half thousand kilometers you go through pretty much um across australia um the long way around so you go through most of the major cities in Australia through um, through Adelaide, through Melbourne, up over um, the, the Snowy Mountains, through Canberra, which is the, the sort of Australian capital territory, um, and then into Sydney. So you've got some very different sections. Um, you know, you've kind of got like a long, flat desert section. Then you've, you traverse into South Australia, beautiful wine country, um it's it's known for holding the the world tour um the first on the calendar which is the tour down under so you're kind of in the adelaide hills um 
and then you traverse through the Great Ocean Road, which is a, a, a beautiful section where a lot of tourists kind of all flock to. Um, so you follow the coastal route, which isn't the, the quickest way to go across Australia, but it is arguably the, the most picturesque into, um, into Vic- Victoria and then through Melbourne. And then you really start with all of the climbing. Um, and a lot of international probably don't realise that there are some pretty big mountains in, um, in Australia. You can get snow um, and we have seen snow come in even in summer, into some of these areas, and it does get pretty cold, um, which caught and has caught out a few few riders in the past because they're all bringing their flip-flops and their, you know, their sort of um, shorts and T-shirts with them, and um, they're like, what do you mean it gets cold? It's Australia, man, and it's summer. <laughs> but you're going through the desert, and then next minute you're going into, the, like, the Alpine region and um, the snowy mountains, and, uh, yeah, it, it does get... Um, challenging for for the last bit of the ride you're you're climbing and doing all all the climbing pretty much in the last section of the race um yeah the so that's the first crown i guess um it's probably the most remote of all three of them um then you get because i guess australia is is like the size of the size of the u.s in terms of mass but the population of greater Los Angeles, so like 20 million people. So it's hardly inhabited, especially wow. in the in the, in the centre. Um, so you don't often see a lot of people or um, have a lot of services like you would in the trans um, trans American bike race, which is a much longer race um, and a bit more climbing. Um, it's 6,800 kilometres, and quite a bit of vert. I think it was something like 60,000 metres or f- close to 60,000 metres of vertical. I don't really – I think it's about 180,000, what, feet, something like that. Or wow. 170. And, um, yeah, so the, the Indi- Indian Pacific was about 17 days, 17 and a half. The Trans-America took me <laughs> much, much longer, um, unfortunately. But is uh, yeah, six thousand eight hundred k's, and you traverse through pretty much the central Midwest um, from West Coast USA, which is essentially a start in um, in Oregon, in Portland, right on the west coast, and you travel through down through Oregon into Idaho, Montana, um, get a bit of climbing um, through Wyoming. Um, Colorado, Kansas, Missouri, um, Kentucky, and then into Virginia, where the finish is in um, in Yorktown. So a very historical kind of finish. Um, yeah, so that's that's number two, and then number three is slightly different than the first two, which is a prescribed kind of route that everyone follows. The third one is the transcontinental in Europe. It always has from the last couple of years, the same start and end, um, which is a small little um, place in Belgium, um, quite o- iconic. Um, it's It finishes in a place called Meteora in Greece, um, which is quite interesting in itself. It's um, Meteora kind of translates into suspended in the sky, Mm. or for the faithful in the heavens above. Um, and it's kind of a, a site of um, six monastery complexes which have survived for, I think, since the 14th century. Um, wow. Built by um, Eastern Orthodox monks. So, yeah, it's quite a quite a place to, to finish. Um, and I'll be very happy when I reach the finish uh, of the third, the third crown, but very different in that you have these control points, um, and each year they're different. This year you're going through. Um, it looks like four checkpoints. Uh, the first one's in Austria, 
um, which is the Bilohoa Pass. Then you're into Slovenia, um, uh, which is a small place called Mangart. And they're all these big summit checkpoints and then into Poland and then into Bosnia. And then um, you get your little Breve card kind of ticked off and stamped through all these four control points and race down onto Meteora and you kind of decide how you'd like to get to all of these checkpoints. So there isn't a, a prescribed route except for following those checkpoints and control points, um, which makes it a bit more challenging because um, I guess following a GPX file and just trying to figure out where you, you sleep and, and um, find food and water um, is challenging enough. But then adding on the navigation side and leaving that up to you is, um, is interesting and, and challenging in itself. But therein is part of the adventure, I guess. Wow. That it sounds remarkable. I kind of like the idea of, of getting to alter the route as long as you make all the checkpoints, you know? Yeah. I think that that's kind of fun. It really adds uh, an element of, uh, maybe an element of surprise. I mean, people might choose the shortest route and find out it's not the fastest route. You know what I'm saying? Well, that's right. And famously, um, one one of our ambassadors, who's probably one of the, arguably the best, ultra distance riders in the world christoph allegard um he's won the transcontinental i think three times more than anyone else has um and he famously was watching the weather and took a 200 kilometer detour to miss um miss some really bad weather and hook onto a really strong tailwind and people were thinking he's lost the plot. He's gone absolutely mad. Why is he doing this detour? And he caught this ripper of a tailwind and ended up winning the race whilst wow. everyone suffered trying to take the shortcut over the mountains. So, yeah, it can make for some really exciting um, exciting racing. But it is, yeah, it's, it's also quite fun because – anything can happen and you're following all these dots all over Europe wondering what route they're taking and what's their strategy and when are they going to sleep and when are they going to take on the mountain and they don't want to sleep up at altitude because it's really high and it's really cold even though it's still summer. So, you know, will some people take unsealed roads? Will they take sealed roads? What kind of equipment do they have in their arsenal to survive? There's all these things going on. Um, so that's quite interesting in itself. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's kind I... of like Hunger Game on wheels. <laughs> well, just so people uh, get a feel for what we're talking about here, you know, these, these races are many thousands of miles. We're not talking about a 500-mile race or even a 1,000-mile race. We're talking about um, the... The Indian Pacific being over 3,000 miles, right? The Trans-American yeah. over 4,000 miles, 6,800 kilometers. I mean, these are yeah. massive distances, and you're doing this self-supported. And yeah. you do it, I, I noticed the strategy here is that a lot of people will, will choose nights not to sleep at all or choose just mm. how much sleep they need to try to be functional on the bike so that they can continue on and, and finish. Um, the whole strategy behind keeping your body fueled and rested and protected from the elements, it, it's got to be really a challenge. Yeah, it is. Like, for me, I can't ride um, for, say, like 36 hours nonstop or do massive days in the saddle comparative to some of the other riders. Um, but I just try and move faster when I am riding. Um Sarah, one of our one one of the curve members, and probably one of the 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 top say ten in the world, she she has an ability to survive on much less sleep than most men, and she she famously won race to the rock, um, a race so hard they put in the headlines that no man could finish because she was the only finisher, and all <laughs> wow. the guys that were racing her. Um, pulled out um and she she kind of blurred the lines between male and female in terms of categorization 
and that's also another thing I love about ultra distance cycling is, you know, it's not men and women, it's just riders. Right. And it kind of removes all of that requirement for watts per kilo and, you know, VO2 max, because that really has no relevance to ultra distance cycling. It's kind of what's between the ears and um, what's in the heart that kind of gets you through these. Um, but yeah, you're right. A lot of riders will spend a lot of time that you get 24 hours in a day and it's how efficiently you use that. It's the marriage of total time and ride time and how much you're willing to sacrifice to put those two together. Mm. Have you guys ever tried a Kind Bar? You may have seen them in your local grocery store, coffee shop, or gym. Kind makes delicious, healthy snacks using whole ingredients. If you're ready to try some tasty and healthy snacks, we've got a special deal for you. You can try 20 Kind Snacks for $20 with their new snack pack. That's 50% off your first snack pack when you subscribe to it through the Snack Club. That's Kind's monthly snack subscription service. The Snack Pack has the perfect mix of Kind favorites with 20 snacks from 7 of their unique product lines, including oats and honey with toasted coconut granola clusters, Kind dark chocolate nuts and sea salt bar, and Kind's crunchy peanut butter protein bar. As you've heard me say, make sure you're also trying out the Kind press bars. They're amazing. All kind snacks are crafted with delicious, wholesome ingredients like nuts, fruits, and whole grain bars to keep your body and your taste buds happy. When you sign up, you'll get 20 snacks for $20, including free shipping, and you also get to try Kind Snack Club, where you'll receive monthly snacks at a discount and get a members-only bonus. Do yourself a favor and go to kindsnacks.com sports to learn more and to get in on this deal for our listeners. That's kindsnacks.com sports. The 180 Flame is the ideal alternative to bulky and fragile gas-burning camp stoves. The 180 Flame utilizes fewer parts with minimal weight and maximized reliability. The locking tab and slot design means there are no hinges, welds, or rivets to fail you in the field. Cook your food and boil water quickly using only small amounts of natural fuels including twigs, grass, pine cones, and leaves. Weighing just 6.4 ounces, the 180 Flame is the ideal alternative to a backpacking stove. You can find your new flame at 180tac.com or a retailer near you. 180 Flame. Think big, pack small. Well, I want to dive into some of the the details, geek out a little bit about the Transamerica race. But before we do, I'd like to rewind and say, why? <laughs> how did you get into biking? And then how did you get into yeah. these ultra cycling events? I mean, wow, it's it's got to be a horribly punishing habit. Um. Well, why? I, I've always enjoyed enjoyed sport. Um, growing up in South Africa, it's kind of expected that you are a sportsman and an academic and high achieving at both. And if you're not, you're kind of excluded from society. Um, <laughs> sounds harsh, but um, <laughs> I was gonna say. that's just the way it is. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's like you're living in an episode of 300. But um, it's it's always been a part of my life i love i kind of have been a lifetime athlete and have been involved in you know life saving and swimming and um, surfing um every kind of team sport and individual sport you kind of just grow up playing them all and finding out what works for you um and got involved in in triathlon and loved loved the sport because i used to swim competitively and i used to run competitively um, but didn't know much about cycling as a teenager till I met my uncle. Um, he, he'd emigrated from South Africa and was living in London and he just had this man cave that was full of like all these really interesting bikes, really, um, very old, old school kind of, he's a campy Campagnolo fan and had all these interesting kind of, um, group sets I'd never heard of. And um, he kind of got me involved in in cycling when I was when I moved to to the UK. Started getting involved in triathlon a bit more and and raced to a high high level. Um, yeah, and when I moved to Australia, cycling was just on another level, um, and sport was on another level. And it was kind of like South Africa, very outdoor outdoor lifestyle, just no issues, no crime or political issues no racial issues so I was like oh I kind of feel like I'm at home and really kind of found my way into the cycling community and met all of the guys from 
from Kurt. And I was in aviation. I was running an aviation brokerage and just found myself in a in a wonderful community of, of cyclists of all descriptions. Like I was racing track. I was getting involved in cyclocross. There was um, crits. You could race a crit um, and win money like every every other night in summer. The days were super long. You know, it's just so much fun being out on the bike, just having fun. It's like you're a kid again, pretty mm. much. So it was like a, a form of escapism because everyone's got these really stressful jobs and then before and after everyone's just having fun on their bikes and Melbourne's really really great in that regard so yeah just got more and more involved in in the cycling community and then uh, a couple of years ago the guys were were really struggling to get the brand out there Um, and that's kind of what I specialize in I love I love meeting people talking to people um, sharing adventures um and said look i I'd, I'd love to help i mean i'm writing the products anyway i love the product i believe in it it's really easy to to tell people about something you believe in so i said well you know i'm traveling around quite a lot i'm happy to you know use some of that time when i'm not working to to talk about curve and that's kind of how things started and just said hey look this is a weakness in the business or we sh- we should be doing this and slowly just built a position up for myself and resigned, invested in, in the business and, um, yeah, became the fourth member of, of Curve. And then that's when all this ultra-distance stuff started because we were building bikes um, to pursue a, a, a very specific goal for one of our founders, Jesse Carlson, um, and he was taking on the, the transcontinental at that time. And so we were trying to build the lightest ultra-distance bike that could go the distance, um, and we did. And Jesse, the great athlete that he is, actually won the Trans-American Bike Race by two days. Um, and he went through tornadoes in Kansas and some s- serious back issues on the first day, um, extreme heat, and, yeah, managed to – to do us all proud so it was it was incredible watching that and i was going man what are these guys like i don't really know much about ultra distance but i don't understand how someone can ride 400 k's a day average and do that sustained kind of effort for for weeks at a time and then sarah decided she wanted to give the trans uh trans american bike race a go as well and you know, it's one of the longest and arguably one of the hardest. And she was leading the race for so long. We were thinking, my goodness, her first ever ultra, she's going to win. Um, and unfortunately, through fatigue and not really understanding her Garmin e-trex, um, this was her first race and she never never really even navigated before. She was going 150 kilometers off course and ended up, <laughs> ended up in fourth or fifth because um, she went the wrong way. But I was kind of I'm friends with all of these nut jobs, as people probably think this is crazy. <laughs> and I was just inspired. Like, you know, cycling in Australia is, is not kind of met with the same um, kind of um, open arms in, in the U.S. You get a lot of space by drivers. Most people are very courteous um, and and regard you as a road user in in Australia, it's not the case. So getting out of that, that that environment and kind of going on these adventures and these, these kind of off the beaten track um, sort of trips became longer and longer for us all. And we were kind of exposed through Jesse and Sarah to ultra distance riding. So I guess, yeah, I, I started riding longer and longer and I rode from Sydney to Melbourne, which isn't, you know, massive distance, but it was about 800 Ks just trying to figure out what this was all about and had a great adventure just with a buddy of mine a couple of years ago. We, it was, um, it was kind of Christmas time and I always go and spend it with my uncle who now lives in Sydney. Um, and we go and ride and have fun. And then we just said, Hey, it's new year's, 
why don't we why don't we just go and ride to Melbourne? Just take a credit card, no real kind of idea on where we're going to go and where we're going to stay each night, but we'll figure it out on the day. We packed a little backpack each and off we went, not knowing that backpacks are not a great idea and you should probably just have like a saddlebag. Right. We were just like, off we go. And that kind of started it all off and we now hold these kind of annual things for the tour down under where we'll do a pilgrimage of 800 Ks in two days and invite people to come and see what it's like to ride longer distances and and show them what it's all about and then it really kicks off the 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 tour down under and we have um pretty much all the world tour riders and world tour teams all in adelaide they're really accessible you've got all this beautiful riding the race itself everyone from around australia and around the world's come to watch the race there's loads of cyclists and it's just a lot of fun um and we kind of go and showcase our bikes and tell everyone about the adventures and how great cycling is in Australia. So I guess that's kind of how it all all came about in a very long-winded explanation for you, Curtis. Well, I appreciate the full history. That's awesome. I think it's an amazing thing that you're you're doing these, these sorts of distances and the community that is around that. sounds It sounds like a really unique approach to living life and experiencing life. I have to ask, man... Um, when you're on a bike for that long, yeah, I, I, I think about back aches. I think about wrists and hands that that yeah. numb out and get sore. And I, you know, I think about just the the fatigue on the whole body, but also the legs. You know, I mean, how do you get past that to do these sorts of distances? Yeah, I think I think the body is an incredible thing, um, and most of the time it listens to your mental state as to whether it figures out if it's in a good physical state. Um, I think you're right. You can kind of try and mitigate all of those issues, Um, you know, hands, um, back, hot foot. Um, I've trapped some nerves in my hands. I haven't been able to use my hands for a few few months. Um, you, You can't feel your fingers unfortunately because um that you kind of pinch nerves and get kind of like a tennis elbow issue um some people's feet swell and like their toenails fall off Mm. you can kind of as you get more experienced those things don't happen so frequently and you understand that you're able to to push through and you can actually carry on um Mm. i guess the mind is probably the the hardest one to to kind of educate on what's possible and what isn't because initially like yourself you're saying well how can you ride for 240 miles and then you do that again and again and again and again and again and you're spending maybe 20 hours on the bike and four hours sleep or or maybe riding through the night but yeah the human body is uh it, it is an incredible incredible thing um and you'll be surprised with what it can actually do um, if you set your mind to it. And so it's it's really exploring not only a, a place that you've never been to before on the map, but it's also exploring yourself, um, those dark areas that you perhaps haven't tested or have found out, um, which is quite interesting um, to, to someone like myself. I'm, I'm quite interested to know what is possible and what isn't. Um, so I guess that's that answers the why. Well, whether it's a possibility or just flat remarkable, <laughs> it's amazing to me that, you know, the human body can do these things. I've talked to other ultra-distance athletes, and they have stories about hallucinations and other just wild things that can happen when you push your body for extended periods of time. Have you had those experiences too? Um, I, I have, and... You you kind of got to be careful with um, because you're a road user and because you're on the road and there are other people on the road. You've kind of got to respect that you're probably the most vulnerable of all. Um, so you kind of I get to a point where I put myself into a state where I need to be in control all of the time because the risks involved with not 
being in control can be severe. So I have experienced hallucinations and sleep deprivation to the point where um, you're falling asleep on the bike and you're having these micro sleeps. Um, and then you've kind of got to look at yourself and say, um, am I now putting myself and others at risk? And that's usually the time that I will I'll, I'll pull up stumps. Sometimes you can get through it and you can push through it. Most of the time, um, if I can't, I'll, I'll have a have a sleep. But yeah, I've I've had some in- interesting situations where I'm crossing the desert and I'm just sort of looking at the road and my dynamo is powering my front light and you're seeing all these different shadows in the tarmac and all I can see is all these little kittens' heads, like cats' heads, and you're like, what are all these kittens doing <laughs> on the road? And then you're like, it's not real, and then you'll see these shapes in the distance, in the darkness, because there's nothing around but you and the Milky Way, which is beautiful. And you're just like, wow, look at all these stars. And you're just like, gosh, this is just amazing. And then you're like, oh, I'm so tired. And I was like, oh, I wish there was like some food somewhere. Wouldn't it be nice to sleep for a moment? And then you see a person and you're like, oh, that's really scary. And then you're like, but that isn't a person. It's just an oddly shaped sign when you get closer to it. And all these things are always playing tricks in your mind. And I know Jesse kind of sees some really interesting things. Maybe he's got a much better imagination than I do. But most of the time, um, my issues have been with um, my my chamois <laughs> and saddle sores, um, mm. which seem to be my biggest problem. Um, famously, having just finished the Transamerica, I underwent some hospital time and had a um, surgeon cut me open and remove a cyst and pack me full of gauze um, and said there's no way you can finish this race you have to take six weeks off the bike you've got a four centimeter um, incision in your um, how do you say ball bag um, <laughs> and you will find it incredibly uncomfortable and you won't be able to race at the level you want to. So you can't finish the, the Trans-American bike race. And I said, look, I appreciate you know what you're talking about, but you might not know what the human body is capable of. Um, you're a medical doctor. I have a girlfriend. She's a doctor. You're probably erring on the side of caution. And that's fine. But I can just stand up and not sit down for the last 600 Ks, and I'll finish. Oh. I've done 6,000 Ks. <laughs> I'm not letting 600 Ks and assist get in the way of me finishing because what that does is it impacts not only this race but the Triple Crown. Right. So I I, I carried on, I took, took a few days off um, and figured out how I was going to um, look after myself because uh, a lot of people were saying there's no way that you can you can pack this each day and remove it. It'll be extremely painful, and um, you need to keep it very clean, and it's just not possible. Uh, it turns out it is possible, and your body just adapts to riding standing up if you teach it to do that. Um, and a friend of mine who's cycling – his name's Ali Denham and he has this blog called cycling about, and he's cycling from the Southern tip of South America all the way to Alaska. And he said, do you know what? I read this guy. He w- he wasn't a cyclist, but he wanted to ride around the world. Um, but he wasn't comfortable with sitting down. He found it really strange. So he, he just rode standing up and he actually rode around the world standing up. And I don't know if he was lying cause I never researched it further or if he was just trying to give me encouragement to finish but i did find that your body just adapts and i i just ended up standing up the first day i couldn't really go very far i think i i think i limped sort of 60 k's and i was like that's it that's all the body can take but i didn't also realize the painkillers that were uh, given to me were so opiate based that they just knock you for six so i unfortunately even though they're wonderful and they just send you off into sleep, they're not actually really great for riding. So stop taking those um, and then rode the next day standing up and and managed to do about 180 Ks and then managed to do another 200 and then 
before you know it, we were at the finish. So, yeah, my experiences with going long have been, unfortunately, I just haven't found the best saddle and chamois that can go the distance. And maybe it's maybe it's me. I've got really wide sit bones, big birthing hips. Maybe it's my <laughs> saddle. You know, I'm just – I'm I'm still learning. I guess that's another great thing about this um, style of riding is you're still learning. You're always learning. The community is so open to to talking about their experiences and there's so much information that's freely available. So many great riders are very accessible um, and you can learn a lot if if you're willing to ask for help. So, wow, um, that's fascinating. Yeah. You know, I'm looking at the chart from the trackleaders.com that came out of the Trans America race, and I, I'm looking at yes. your speed versus time plot. And yes. what's fun about that is, it, you know, you, the speed's not necessarily as exciting to me as watching how long you were moving between stops, right? And I can see yeah. your top speeds of, you know, 30 something miles per hour and, and that sort of thing, and your average speeds that look like they're around 15 and uh, going huge distances. But what's fun about this is I'm looking here at, at like timestamp 230 and you're riding and then it doesn't stop for another significant rest until like 280. So I'm thinking, well, there's 50 hours of riding right there. That was like a two day straight stint that you did. Yeah. I mean, well, there was there were some sections where you know weather uh, is um, is good. The I, there were parts in Kansas that we were kind of either trying to get away from some really nasty weather systems, um, or it just it made sense to ride through the night because of the heat. So you kind of take advantage of those situations. Mm. And I wanted to ask this especially. Uh, lots of climbing in the Trans American Bike Race, Wyoming, Montana, yeah. Colorado, uh, not to mention the Cascades out west. And uh, when you got to Kansas, now you're in the long rolling hills with potential for crazy wind. Did you have mm. a, a favorable wind, or was it against you? It unfortunately was a, a, a southeasterly, which is a cross headwind. Oh. Um, yeah. So which is which worse of, then, the the climbing yeah, in the mountains or the wind? For me, like I've I've done the Indian Pacific Wheel Race twice now, um, and every year uh, for the first two thousand k's, it's usually a headwind, and so you kind of just get accustomed to being just hit in the face, sitting on what you imagine to be a really long climb, because riding on the flat into a 35k an hour cross headwind it's pretty much like climbing right (laughs) and it's it's just being comfortable with the fact that you're going really slow and understanding that you're going slow but so is everyone else that's in the near vicinity and yeah kansas was difficult because it's really flat and it's always got some really difficult weather to deal with whether it's kind of tornadoes um lightning really really like i had some lightning storms that i thought oh, there's no shelter i can't really do anything about it and i'm concerned that i'm going to get struck by lightning at the moment trying to kind of evade the the, the those systems and and seek some shelter but there is nothing so you've just got to keep riding so you and just keep going just keep going because you know, there's nothing really else you can do. Wow. Um, which is unnerving, um, but beautiful as well. Cause I mean, the sky is lighting up every other second, you know, there's sort of sheet lightning rattling through the heavens. Um, and you're kind of just switching off every electrical device you have, just hoping that that might make a difference. <laughs> and you're wishing that your rubber tires were about 10 feet thick, right? Yeah, that's right. Going, I'm sure these rubber tires will be insufficient for me not to <laughs> get into any trouble. Wow. Yeah. Well, I see on your time chart here that the 
The Ford Momentum, the Ford Progress, stopped off a little before 500 hours, and uh, that must be the gap when you were in the hospital. Yeah, that would have been um, where I had the embarrassing situation of explaining what exactly I got up to and and why I needed some help. (laughs) (laughs) By now you certainly know who Bent Gate is. That's for a great reason. Bent Gate Mountaineering has been sponsoring the Adventure Sports Podcast almost from the beginning, and we really appreciate that. They've made it possible for all the great shows to continue coming your way. We want to say thanks by reminding you to go to them for your backcountry gear. If you live in Colorado, then just stop by their store in Golden. If not, go to bentgate.com. They have what you need from the latest ultralight gear to the tried and true classics for climbing, hiking, and camping, like Arcteryx, Hilleberg, Nemo, Western Mountaineering, and many more. Need advice? They have you covered there, too. Their staff are passionate adventurers who can offer help from their own experiences. Bentgate also hosts lots of events and speakers. Check out their website to see the schedule and to see all of their products. Help take care of the Adventure Sports Podcast by getting your gear from Bentgate Mountaineering. Camp Crate is a gear rental trip planning service. So if you contact us, we will plan a backpacking trip for you if you don't have one planned. And then we rent you all the gear and send it to your house, send it to your hotel, wherever it needs to go, anywhere in the U.S., we will ship you gear. And then once you're done, you put it back in the box and return it back to us. Most of our customers are first timers. So we want to give you the confidence to go out into the wilderness with the right gear and with the know-how. And also with 24-7 support, we're able to really make you feel comfortable while at the same time challenging yourself physically and emotionally and mentally. So we had some customers in the backcountry call us because they were concerned they had altitude sickness and we were able to talk them down, get them to a safe place, create an emergency plan, and we were willing to do anything we needed to get them out of there. But they ended up taking our advice and still having a really good trip. I know that a lot of people have told us it's been life-changing for them, the best trip they've ever done. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook. We're always updating that. Our website is campcrate.net. Well, it's amazing that you finished, and man, kudos to you. I don't think there are a lot of people who have the the guts, the the, the sheer grit to press on in those sorts of situations, to stand up and pedal for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kilometers, you know? But you did it. You finished the race, and wow, that's that's crazy. Yeah. um, My mate Jesse says, um, death before DNF. (laughs) (laughs) apparently that's my style of riding so yeah i haven't i haven't completed a race that i've started i haven't not completed a race i've started shall i say so yeah well i i'm gonna relate my one bike race that i was in (laughs) i bought a new bike never even did a shakedown ride went out and took off on my very first race and the bike fell apart that whoever put it together didn't <laughs> tighten everything down. The stuff was falling off all over the place. And I kept falling farther and farther behind. And finally, I caught up with a friend of mine. And he was just at his end. He had gone as hard as he could go. And he looked over at me and says, I'm done. I'm going to jump on the sag wagon. And I thought, oh, well, I don't have a crack at winning this thing. I might as well get on the sag wagon, wagon with him. And then the results came out, and I saw that DNF. I didn't even know that was a thing. And yeah. I have to tell you, you know, Ryan, I was like, oh, why did I stop? It was only because I didn't see a reason to keep going. I had no idea that there would be a DNF category. And uh, I'm kind of like you. I I don't know about death before DNF, but I'll tell you what, (laughs) I don't ever want to see a DNF again. It was just, I know it was crazy. It's horrible, isn't it? Yeah. Because, I mean, give it a few more Ks, give it a couple of hours, it'll always get better. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, your friend would have your friend your friend would have been probably bonking. He's probably got no glycogen left. He's gone really hard. He's out of food. Mentally, he's kind of defeated. He's been dropped off the back. He's got no one to ride with. That's when the race starts. Hmm. Well, if it were repeatable and it's not, I think instead I would just come alongside him and say, 
let's go. We'll, we'll on, finish man. together. <laughs> and then let's go, yeah. That would have been the right response for certain. Wow. Well, it's amazing that you pressed on through and made that happen. I was reading through the Facebook posts where people are giving you support and and uh, yeah. accolades and and you know you kind of get just a little bit of the story, right? And yeah. uh, there's so much more to that. But here's the last one that posted here was from Jennifer, who said, "Sweet victory is within sight, Ryan." And I, I just think, man, what did that feel like when you finally completed, when you rolled up and you knew that you had done it, no DNF? Yeah, it's bittersweet. I still remember it because there wasn't the same satisfaction that I got from seeing the Sydney Opera House and, you know, doing a really good time and knowing that I kind of left it all out there. Um, it was different because... I felt a bit more rested. I'd spent a lot of time resting from being cut open. Um, I'd had about four days off the bike, so my legs felt good. I wasn't as fatigued as the other riders that were finishing around me. Actually, I looked like I hadn't even I hadn't even done the Trans America. Mm. You know, I'd had a shave. I'd uh, I washed my clothes. <laughs> I'd been sleeping in a bed. You know, I hadn't been sleeping in a ditch for so long. My body was wasn't as beat up as probably how it should be and that's probably why we tried a friend of mine who um, was also racing I'm, he, I managed to catch them both he's also a South African guy that lives in England and we just said look it's the last big stretch it's about 275 k's and I really want to do it in about 10 hours and just leave it all out there and we did we pretty much tried to kill each other um that that last sort of 270 and we raced as hard as we could and when we finally got there you know he he'd been on the road for a long time and he was he was spent and i was tired but i yeah it was it was bittersweet because it was like i've done it i've done this ridiculous ride across the country but i don't feel like i raced it how i set about giving it a red hot go when i when i sort of launch from the start line um because i was you know i was kind of in top in the top 10 i was i'd had a few issues with my knees and had, had fallen back into like 30th place and then raced as hard as i could to work my way through the field and was back in i think ninth at that stage and then this happened and i was just like damn you know like is there such a thing as a perfect race? I'm yet to find out if if it if that pursuit for a perfect race is is, is a stupid idea. Um, and I was I was disappointed with what had happened, but I was also proud of of finishing and not giving up when things became quite difficult. So it was yeah, it was a strange mix of emotion, and you kind of take a long time to digest that all because you've been out in the wild for you know two three weeks you're, you're always on your own you don't have a lot of communication with the outside world now and again you traverse through it but you don't really interact with it other than to stop get some food maybe say hi can i get a coffee and this and a thousand ice creams and <laughs> a kilo bag of Doritos and then you're back on the road again and that's kind of your human interaction and so you spend a lot of time inside this strange little bubble and a lot of time with yourself so it takes a while to kind of put all those thoughts into into place and I don't think I have done quite that yet but I do remember finishing and going I'm a little disappointed I was very very happy to to finish um, just n not as as happy with not being able to race it the way I wanted to. I think that there's plenty of celebration to be had for finishing against all odds, and I think it's fantastic, you know. I, it's interesting. I won't go on about it, but Freakonomics did a show on incrementalism in which they were interviewing the uh, the coach for the U.K. cycling team and he was talking about all the tiny little things that they would do to try to mm. get them all to add up to most excellent cycling. 
And they even went so far as hauling mattresses from hotel to hotel so the riders could sleep on the same mattress every night. <laughs> yeah, that, this, that sounds like um, Dave, David Brailsford, <laughs> the pursuit of marginal gains. Well, it and does. this is kind of just the opposite, isn't it? When you're self-supported and taking it as it comes. Yeah, I mean, it is and it isn't. Like, you have to be very, like, there is a huge amount of planning and preparation because all of those marginal gains do add up as you, you know, the body can get beaten up and it, it can recover for sure, but you've got to protect it and look after it in the best way that you can each day. Like you've got to, if you're feeling really good, great, but don't go hard because you're going to feel really, really bad later, keeping mm. that little bit of reserve in. Like when you do go to sleep, how do you sleep? Do you sleep with your legs elevated to encourage more recovery, to flush more lactic acid out of the system and encourage new blood flow into your legs? How do you, how do you sleep? When do you sleep? What kind of nutrition do you put into your body each day? Um, how far are you going to ride? And how often are you going to sleep? And what do those sleep cycles look like? And do you enter into a, a deep sleep or a REM sleep or um, a, a sleep that's going to leave you groggy and, uh, and wanting more? So you're right, you're taking it as it comes, but you're also looking at 6,800 Ks very closely and going, that's where I'm going to pick up food and water and this is where I'm going to sleep and I'm going to sleep inside here because we're going through bear country and we're at altitude and if I sleep outside and I get it wrong and I get too cold, it's going to hurt me in coming days and I'll be so fatigued that I won't be able to operate at a level that I need to to be able to win or to cover 200 miles. So there, there are marginal gains in in the way that you you ride these sorts of races or race these sorts of races. And to be very good at them, it's understanding all of those and putting them in place to have that supposed perfect race. Um, and as you get more experienced, you learn about yourself and what works for you, but also how to to, to marry all of these different disciplines like surviving and and, and sleeping outside and, and planning, route planning, um, what you can do without in the wild and on your bike and what you can't, how you set up your bike to be the most efficient but also the most comfortable, how you protect your hands and your body and your lips and your skin. All those things are, are always being played in your mind when when it's extremely wet or extremely cold. Um, how you adapt, you know, is there a serious headwind? Is it 40 degrees and you have to switch your sleep cycles up and you're riding through the night and you're sleeping through the heat of the day? Um, all of those things are, are constantly playing out in your in your mind and that's where all the tactics and the the interesting side of the sport exists that you probably don't always see. It's the experience that probably keeps you coming back, like you were saying, the pursuit of the perfect race, you know, that, uh, that's, that's, that's right. the target. That's the goal. That's amazing. Um, the speed plot, there's a point on your plot here where you are at about 2,700 miles, so well along, and you yeah. peak out over 30 miles per hour, and you stay there for miles and miles and miles. That must have been one amazing downhill. Do you know where that was? Oh, 2,800 miles. Gosh. No. No, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just looking at this. I thought, well, maybe he's coming down out of the Appalachians or something, you know, because uh, it, it had to be an amazing or uh, a 50 mile per hour tailwind would have done it for you too. Yeah, 2,800 miles. I can have a look and see where that would put me. Um, <laughs> let me see if I can figure that out. That's just kind of the fun of it to look at that. Yeah, so 2,800 miles. You're going through Missouri at that stage. Um, you're kind of midway through Missouri, it looks like. 
just actually pull up the um there's actually i'm looking at the uh trans and bike race and there's still guys out there wow yeah so i think it was 115 people that started um i think about 50 riders pulled out there's seven active people still riding of which it looks like two are still riding through missouri good on them so they're still they're still going that's fantastic yeah it looks like 2800 miles would put you in the mark twain national forest (laughs) Hmm. and sort of just past springfield um kind of going into eminence it seems wow so i was doing yeah wow 30 miles an hour for a long time (laughs) yeah that's you kind of you're really in the um you're at the start of the the appellations there so i have no idea how i was holding that kind of speed (laughs) to be honest (laughs) well maybe it was one of those hallucinations maybe uh you thought there was a lion (laughs) chasing you or something or one of those bears (laughs) oh actually yeah there there were a lot of dogs i must say a lot of dogs so that's fantastic well, Ryan, we burned through our time, man. I really enjoyed hearing all about this ultra-distance cycling. It's amazing to me what you do. And I I don't care that you had to spend a few days in the hospital and recovering. I think it's amazing that you pressed on and you finished, you know, with so much trying to get you to drop out. You succeeded with no DNF. And I think it's a fantastic attempt. I, I think it's something that you should really, really celebrate and I am excited to hear how things go for you on the transcontinental race. And, oh, thanks, uh, you mate. know, we're going to be pulling for you. Love to hear that you did it, that you finished the Triple Crown. That'd be fantastic. Well, I'll keep you posted. Um, and, yeah, thanks so much for having me on, uh, on your podcast, mate. You know what? We need to get a little bit more information about Curve Cycling. How can people get more information? Uh, well, we're, we're pretty active. Um, on, on social media, we have um, we have a good presence on Instagram. We kind of um, have uh, a Facebook um, page as well, and we have a website, all pretty much the same thing, Curve Cycling. Um, so, yeah, check us out um, if you're interested, and you can follow my adventures through through that as well. Wonderful. Well, right on. Well, thanks again for taking the time to share with us today. Oh, no worries, mate. Thanks thanks for your time, and uh, thanks for the listeners. Oh, you bet. You bet. And for all the listeners out there, wow, can you believe it? Can you imagine <laughs> doing that kind of distance? Amazing, amazing stuff. Whatever it is that you love to do, whatever your passion is, make sure that until the next show, you do get out there and do it and have some fun. Thanks for listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast. How about you do yourself and us a favor by joining us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash adventuresportspodcast. To become a patron, it's only $5 a month, and you get access to our Friday Life Outside the Box series episodes for patrons only. You'll also have the chance to win some of our product demo prize giveaways. Head on over to patreon.com slash adventuresportspodcast and sign up. Thanks, guys.